From his first job flipping burgers at McDonald's and delivering the Washington Post, Craig Willett counts only one and a half years of his adult life working for someone else. Welcome to the Biz Sherpa Podcast with your host, Craig Willett, founder of several multi-million dollar businesses and trusted advisor to other business owners. He's giving back to help business owners and aspiring entrepreneurs achieve fulfillment, enhance their lives, and create enduring wealth. The Biz Sherpa. This is Craig Will at the Biz Sherpa joining you today from Tulsa, Oklahoma. I'm pleased to have with me David Friedman, who's a premier harness maker, saddle maker, and leather goods maker. He started out six generations ago. He's the sixth generation in the family of harness makers. I hope you get a good flavor for what a good business family the Friedman family is, and particularly what David's been able to do and innovate today. Welcome, David. Thank you, Craig. Glad to have you as a guest today. And David hails from Ontario, Toronto, Ontario, Canada, and has also figured out how to have a business in the United States, not just on the road, but permanently. Uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit about what it's like to be a sixth generation business owner. Well, it's uh, a long, obviously a long winded answer that I would come up with um, <clears throat> to answer this question, but uh, it, it's interesting to be part of a, of a very old family business. And I think it goes through a lot of different stages. Um, I've been on my own since 91, since my dad's passing, so quite a, quite a few years already. Um, as a young man, uh, apprenticing under my father for nine years, hearing about the family business, hearing about uh, its uh, movement from Europe to Canada and how my grandfather came over and, and sort of restarted in Toronto. And so where did they start in Europe? Uh, my grandfather came from Poland in 1910 to Toronto and set up shop in downtown. And uh, his work primarily was for drays and, and street delivery wagons, you know, in the early 1900s. That's how that before, was the- that, before, the, before the car. Before the car. And that was the mode of transportation and delivery and, uh, and commerce, you know, things were moved around. And um, back then, people didn't buy a complete set of harness for their, their milk wagon or bread wagon or delivery dray. They bought parts and pieces and, and, and there was a lot of repairs. My father used to tell me as a young boy, he remembers downtown in Toronto on Centre Avenue, uh, there'd be a lineup of these um, delivery drivers all around the corner waiting for my grandfather to open up the shop so they can come in and it'd be, you know, splice a, a rein, put a new piece in it or, uh, or repair a trace, which is the piece of leather that connects the horse to the wagon or put a stitch in or something to that effect or so know, they could do their part. work for the day so they could get their work done for the day or pick up and go on and i have these old logs really interesting old log books and uh it'd say you know borden's dairy you know splice a trace five cents you know um, repair an up tug which is a part on the set of harness 20 cents and you know totals it up for the month you know to be total for the month 23 dollars or something to this effect and i'm not even sure how in 1910 in, 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 and beyond. I'm not even so sure how these guys carved out a living back then, but somehow they managed to, to carve it out and make it happen. So it's definitely a trade that has to be learned. It's not something you can just pick up and say, hey, I want to be a harness maker someday and buy a business and be able to do it without skill. Exactly. My grandfather had an interesting thing happen to him. Uh, a gentleman by the name of Eddie Godfrey who was English, who worked in the Chicago stockyards, had an aunt that lived outside of Toronto in a small town called Bob Cajun. And um, it was his only family in North America. So Eddie moved to Toronto, somehow found my grandfather, and they worked together for years and years. Because Eddie'd worked in Chicago stockyards, because he was from England, he knew the finer side of making hackney harness, fine harness, carriage harness. And wow. Eddie would be the man that would teach my father at the ripe old age of 10 how to make this fine quality workmanship and finer types of harness different than what my grandfather made from the street. Back in those days, um, if you had a sewing machine or a stitching harness stitching machine, uh, it was a sign of laziness and poor quality. So everything was done by hand and anything that was done by machine, in the daytime, the machine was covered up with a tarp, so the old Teamsters and drivers couldn't see oh, really? that you had that a you machine. Had it. <laughs> yeah, you, know, <laughs> you weren't doing it by hand. Exactly. You weren't doing it the old-fashioned way. So um, 
Eddie taught my father all the finer points. And my father tells me at 10 years old, he remembers Eddie picking him up, sitting him on the bench, and my dad watching this all day long, wow. watching Eddie work. And um, that, I think that relationship with my grandfather lasted, oh, well into the, uh, well into the, right through World, World War II, actually. Really? Until uh, Eddie passed away. Yeah. So how did the so how did the family ha what was the evolution like because then the cars came in so the heavy duty harnesses work harnesses probably became less and less in demand to they be became, made and to be repaired that's right they became obsolete um, just like the horse and wagon as we knew it and um, you know this was the only trade my father really knew he was trying to uh, make ends meet he was trying to figure out what to do with his life. And he went to the first Royal Winter Fair in Toronto, famous indoor horse show, yeah. after World War II. And um, he was actually driving a cab. And he looked around and he saw American Saddlebreds. He saw Hackney Ponies. He saw people with private carriages and coaches and hunters and jumpers. And he, as a visionary guy, my father was really bright this way, said, you know, these things are not going, going to go away. There's going to be people that horses create value for, and they're going to want to do things with these horses that were different than my grandfather did. And he had the skills and knowledge from Eddie, how to make this harness. Right. And a love and a passion for love leather, passion. I'm sure. Exactly. With a, with a grade six education, self-taught to read and, uh, really? and write. Grade six. Grade six. So the gentleman that woke up every morning and read the newspaper, you know, sort of start to finish, was interested in sports but had a real passion for quality and emulating the past. So he was driving cab to kind of make ends meet and he saw this horse show and it inspired him to take what step came next for him. <clears throat> he was working, um, doing some work and trying to make ends meet. And um, he managed to, uh, he had a couple of friends that were in, in the Hackney Pony business in the Toronto area. And slowly through a couple of different uh, barns, he got bigger and bigger and bigger. He, um, he was introduced to the Armstrong family, famous family from, from the Toronto area that had ABC farms. They had a lot of hackney ponies and horses. And, well, so um, they had a lot of demand for harnesses like this demand. to show. That's right. But even then, they weren't ordering complete sets. You know, here, son, make three bridles. My dad would go back and make the three bridles. Three bridles would be like an order for like 50 sets today, especially for a one-man shop. Wow. Right? So... He got a lot of uh, nice little orders like that and then grew and grew and grew until he met some people from England named Frank and Cynthia Hayden. And this would be in the late 60s and um, sort of mid 60s. And they took his work to England, which brought really? him international fame right away because nobody overseas was doing this type of work. Really? So his craftsmanship that he learned as a 10 year old sitting on the bench became world famous very quickly and you know sometimes it's a question of uh, how many people are doing the same thing you're doing and it's also a question of who you know not what you know so I think the combination of those two things um, took him international right away. What was the purpose of the Haydens taking the, sat the harnesses to England? They were showing a lot of uh, horses and ponies as well um, they were um, they were deeply involved with the royal family, with a lot of uh, coaching and carriage driving in England, and they also worked for, a, for an astute uh, gentleman in uh, Armenia, New York, named Chauncey Stillman, who had a lot of coaches and carriages as well. And they also worked for a family in Toronto, um, and they, uh, they'd travel the world working these hackney ponies and horses for, for different people. So, so people to, saw his workmanship in Europe and all of a sudden they were sending orders back to your dad to yeah. make them. It didn't take long, but it wasn't enough business still. Really? He, um, just about um, in, sometime in the, in the 50s, nighttime standard bread racing took off in Canada. There was no Toronto Blue Jays, there was no, you know, NBA, there was the Toronto Maple Leafs, and we had our Canadian Football League, and that was it. So if you wanted to do anything other than going to your Sunday night bowling league, you had to go to Paramutual, but you had to go to the standard bread or thoroughbred races. And nighttime standard bread racing became a big thing, and he... And they need harnesses And they need that. a lot of harness. So through the... And heavy duty, because that's... That's right. 50s, 60s, and 70s, he was building a thousand sets a year of this harness and sort of supplementing the, um, the standard bread business 
with the high-end quality of the Hackney and Saddlebred and, and some Morgan Arabian business as well. Wow. And so, now today you continue. You, we're here at the U.S. National Championship for the Arabian horses, so you continue to go to the shows for Saddlebreds, which I've showed in before, and mm -hmm. I use your harness. Yeah and love it, and it's been a key to one of my, to my success. You taught me a long time ago that the harness, if it's set right, should help do all the work because it's where your leverage points are, so you're not, as the driver, having to do all the work. But anyway, you go to the Morgan Nationals, so you travel quite a bit to get to these shows. How did your dad, is this something you started to do? Is this something your dad started to do? How did you get out of the shop in Canada and, and into the showroom at the, at the horse shows. You know, I remember this really distinctly, Craig. My father was a, um, he was a just do it kind of person. Um, I, I remember we'd go to a few shows. We'd go to a carriage driving show. And my dad went to Devon every year. Sometimes I went with and with not, sometimes I didn't, but on foot, never with a, a booth or a display. And um, I, I'd asked him in, uh, <clears throat> in the early 80s when I first came into the business, what have you not done with this business that you always wanted to do? Because I really didn't want to rest on his laurels. Right. And, uh, and I'll circle back to, to how, he, how he sort of enabled us all to move ahead. And he said, I always wanted to make handbags and belts and high-end leather goods. And that's something that I have always wanted to do. I just didn't have the opportunity to do it. So I sort of took the bull by the horns and started going down this road. And, and um, I'd met some people from New York City that had worked with Ralph Lauren, and um, they wanted to meet me. So I said to my dad, hey, dad, these guys want to meet me in New York City. So he's, Boy, people he, that work for Ralph Lauren, that's quite an opportunity. On, it was an interesting opportunity, a cross-telephone conversation between our buckle supplier and their buckle supplier in England. And um, our, at that time, this buckle supplier had a little bit of a liquid lunch every day, so he got me confused <laughs> with he got me confused with the guys in New York, and he oh, started really? calling me by this gentleman's name, and it was a little bit confusing. So I ended up calling this guy up, saying, "Hey, we've got the same buckle supplier," and we hit it off on the phone. And he said, "What do you do?" I said, I "Make harness and harness and saddles and et cetera in Toronto." Oh, maybe you can make belts for us. Come on down to New York City and meet us. I thought, okay, that's great. So I went and told my dad. I said, Dad, I met these guys on the phone and everything was phone those days. And my dad said to me something I'll never, never forget, which has been an interesting piece of my life. He said, just jump on the airplane and go meet them. I said, what do you mean? He says, just go buy a ticket and jump on the plane and go. And you're like, we've never done that before. Yeah, right. we didn't do that kind of thing. And <laughs> right, we sit here and take orders and fulfill orders exactly. and ship them all over the world. So I jumped on the airplane and bought a ticket and went down there and, you know, those days, you know, maybe I flew once a year, once every other year on family vacation or something like that. But it wasn't like now or, or you know, pre-pandemic when you're on the airplane every other week. Right. Um, and um, it, he was so encouraging to um, reach out, go for what you want and explore it, um, that it, it really, it changed my life and um, made me global quickly. So your, your vision became taking what your dad's inspiration was. He was visionary to going into show harnesses and saddles and seeing this opportunity going from the old industry of, of commercial harnesses for work purposes to now something fancier. He had a vision also of handbags and leather goods, but he really planted that seed in your mind. So how did that meeting go with Ralph Lauren in New York? It actually went really well. We, uh, we did some work for them for a number of years, private label, and um, uh, we had a great relationship with those people. We did a bunch of different things in the private label core. Um, after my dad's passing in 91, um, when you're looking at what you're doing and where you're going, I started to really struggle with doing anything wholesale. I didn't think the margins were, were there and um, available to sort of bank on all this hand work and hand labor that we were doing. And uh, we were in a recession, 91, 92. Oh, yeah. And I sort of stepped away from the entire wholesale business. Not to not get phone calls from these guys. Hey, Friedman, when you come into New York, what's happening? What are you showing us? What do you have for us? Right. And I was more about, well, I'm going to uh, sort of retool here and figure out what I'm going to do in Toronto. and and try and make some harness and, and... So how'd you take it to the next level? I mean, you could sit back and continue to fill oh. orders for your retail customers and your... with the reputation you had worldwide, but 
now I see, and, and our viewers will see what you have here a little bit later, but you have quite a display and quite a range of product. How did you decide to take that on the road? You know, I think it's a question of, uh, of change over time and being cognizant of that possible change. At that particular time in my life, I had a business mentor, I've had many over the years, um, that sat me down and he, my parents had passed away close together, 10 months apart, and I was pretty much down in the dumps in 92. I didn't know what I was doing. I really didn't have a lot of direction or purpose. Um, I'd just been married and um, was trying to find a way to support my family. So you're hitting the reset button in 92. Yeah. Going, and I'm hey, just... wait, I've got this business. My dad passed away. Mm -hmm. There's a legacy here, a family legacy I want to preserve. Now I got to figure out what to do with it. And they're big shoes to fill because my dad had this international reputation. So it's a question of, are you hitting the hard reset or are you hitting the full reset? <laughs> so, you know, it was a question of, you know, what's going on? And, and uh, I had this business mentor who was a real fashion maven. He had a lot of retail stores. And he sat me down and he said, well, what do you do for a living? I said, what do you mean? He, says, he said, what do you do for a living? I said, well, I make harness, belts handbags, small leather goods, men's and ladies. He said, no, 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 what do you do? I said, well, I make harness and I just <laughs> rhymed off the same thing. And he said to me, he said, and I was struggling at all of it. None of it was going really well. And um, international reputation for doing the best work around and being the best you can be. And here I am, you know. That's a lot of pressure. So struggling. that's one of the Big things shoes. going from a fourth, fifth, to a sixth generation, it's hard because there's a big shoes to fill and it can be very overwhelming. Hard. Very hard and very overwhelming. And after I said this over and over again to this gentleman, he said to me, don't you guys have an international reputation for building the best harness? I said, yes, we do. And then he said to me, what are you doing building belts and handbags? Nobody knows you in that business. That's gonna be a difficult business at retail to meet people, to get it out to the mainstream. Nobody knows what you do. Nobody understands the story. And that sort of- Let alone the cost, of, let alone the cost to promote it. If exactly. you have a reputation, then the cost to market this is considerably less than trying to get into a retail market. Exactly, and I was struggling. You know, you're in the middle of a recession. I couldn't get paid by these retail stores. So not only did you have our time making the goods, then you couldn't collect the money, you know, and all these different things. So that sort of set me back and I let it all go. And then all these, all these belts and handbags sort of went to the wayside and... Um, and went back to the core of the, the family core, business. Core competency of the business. Luckily, in 93, there was a world championship horse show in uh, Gladstone, New, Jer New Jersey, for um, carriage driving, for driving two horses at one time. And it gave us a chance to, again, relaunch the company, reposition the company as what we did. And um, we filled our order book. So we sort of didn't look back. Once we filled that order book, things started to really move on the carriage driving side. Fine carriage driving for antique carriages, reproduction harness, uh, really bespoke type work. And, um, we and there's had, some major competitions around the world. In there that. are, there are. And we had, some, we had some really good clients that helped us, you know, get all the best work that we could possibly get into the shop. And we had a small crew. I think we had maybe seven people working at that time. In the shop, old artisans, most of them were inherited through my my father through inheriting the business. So, you know, whether so I these were to, true craftsmen yeah. that knew the trade. And whether I wanted to do things my way or not, they were getting done their way. So, you know, <laughs> because they're inherited, so that's just the way it's gonna be. So that's sort of how So it's not like you oh, can just man. go out on the street and say, I need a harness maker and you put an ad in the paper and can hire one. Very difficult trade to uh, to hire skilled people for and getting obviously more difficult as time goes by. And you know, we we can hire different allied trades, you know, from the shoe side, from the handbag or even jackets. Right. And translate some of their skills. Some of them. Right, but I think it's, what's really interesting though is that you went back to the core business and I think easily, and it happens to all of us in business, we think, okay, I'm gonna try to be all things to all people and he, people like our stuff and that there's demand and when that demand goes away, really you have to look at what is your core. So you were able to capitalize on that in, in the harness making. 
And I wanted to business. learn it. And I wanted to learn all about it, everything about this, that part of the business. So how did um, you go about learning it? You know, you just you, like everything else I do, I threw myself into it. I went to as many shows as possible, talked to as many people as possible, learned a lot about antique carriages and about all their equipment and equipage and uh, how to, uh, how these things should be harnessed and with what types of horses and all the appointments and, and everything surrounding it, read a lot of books and um, became very, very interested. And that market was growing, so that was great at the time. We always had our sort of finger on the pulse of the, of the American Saddlebred and Hackney Pony business, but they, were, they weren't as key or in the forefront as they are, they have been the last 10 or 12 years. So, you know, or even more now, but... Uh, well, you said something really interesting too that I, I'd like to follow up a little bit about, and that is, you not only went to the show and you got orders, but you had you said you had some good clients who made sure you got good orders. So how did that go about? Because it se seems to me there's a relationship here. It's not just, okay, we're great harness makers, but we care about people. Because you went out and taught yourself by talking to people. And that's sometimes we get stuck sitting back in our shops or back in our offices thinking we're gonna brainstorm and come up with the best idea in a vacuum, so to speak. And you strike me as an individual who has been successful because you've launched yourself out there, exposed yourself to your weaknesses and your strengths, but put yourself in front of people. How did that go? You said some good clients. How did that come about in you New know, Jersey? You gotta put yourself out there, like you said. Um, and these people were spending quite a bit of money. So, and they're taking a piece of your heart in respects to your workmanship because you're putting your heart and soul into this workmanship. So at that level, I felt that I need to have relationships, you know, where I got to know these people and their families and what they do and exactly what they were doing with this harness that we were building. You know, you're talking 20, 30, 40, 50, even $60,000 a set of harness. You know, that's a big piece of, of time and a big piece of your heart and soul in life. And, um, you know, I've gotten some great business advice over the years, and Martha Stewart told me years ago, I was doing some work for her, she said, don't take on a client that won't take you to your next client, because that's just a waste of time. And I wow. thought, okay. So if, if Craig Willett knows somebody, he can sure introduce me to somebody else that may need my, my wares. And um, that's how I've sort of built this whole reputation along. You well, know, and I know you're not just saying that too, because I've experienced it. I can walk in at any show, and you could be with a client or a customer and you'll always remember my name. And that makes me want to come back and makes me want to tell other people about your product. Yeah, I think on the retail side of, of meeting people and selling people, it's still about relationships. Um, I think uh, the buyer experience is um, a little bit more than just pushing buy online. Uh, sure, if they know what they're purchasing and they've purchased it before, that's fine. But I think there's more value in, in building a relationship, especially if you're building a reputation. So I can go online and buy these harnesses and head stalls and everything, right? And people do, you know, all the time. And we are not ever surprised by the people that buy them because they're people that we have already met at shows. They've already um, right. done so their So some of your research. repeat is yeah, they know what they're going to get. They know what they're buying. They know what they're going to get. They understand the consistencies and how they work here. And um, they are okay with the purchase, the product that they've purchased um, with that user experience. So David, one thing that our audience really is curious about, and I, and I, and I think they should be, is how do you deal with the customers? You, there's so many options out there, you have competition. How do you stay ahead and stay foremost in the mind of your target audience? Well, that's a pretty deep question. <laughs> I think, you, um, I think it, you know, it all comes down to product. You still have to have the product. You still have to uphold your reputation and the values that are true to you and your family and your business. Um, because you know, these businesses, these old family businesses, they morph and they change, but you have to steward this somewhere, whether it's for yourself or for the next generation. Um, we have, um, we try to let the product do the talking in respects to building great products. We try and build products that people want, and we try and build products that are in demand. And I don't ever profess to be a product um, 
genius in respect to coming out with products on the market that nobody has. I just make sure I keep my ear to the ground and listen to our horse trainers and listen to our industry experts that dictate what, the pro what products the industry needs and then I develop those products for the need. So, so you kind of go to the experts even in the industry. So if I'm new in the, in the show business, which I was at one point, and I'm sitting there trying to decide I need a harness for a horse because I've decided this is something I want to do. I may find you at a show or I may talk to someone I trust who's training my horse and they may know you and your workmanship and say, you know, you really need to go visit with David Friedman. He's got the right equipment for your horse. And is that kind of how it is? I mean, it, how do you, how exactly do you get how people that, to exactly influence is. people and drive traffic to you? It's exactly how that is, Craig. And, and really what happens is these trainers subconsciously know that my product is, is evolving. So it's easy for you to speak to your trainer and say, hey, what was Friedman Harness like 25 years ago? And they could say, oh, it was good. It was great, but it's different or better now. And it may not be any better, but it may have more morphed into a different type of product where it may be more user friendly, maybe um, we've evolved with the shapes and styles for the type of driving or breed or showing now because these breeds evolve as we, as we breed more horses. So um, I think that, that that's a key point in the first contact and you know through one of your trainers i wouldn't have never met you and your family if it wasn't for one of these trainers so uh jim stakowski in in, uh, right. in particular and um he puts a lot of faith and confidence in us that we will deliver excellence to you which in turn delivers excellence to him reliability i was driving and showing and i don't know i was using one of their older harnesses may have been yours may not have been yours i don't know but as I started to do better and better and I was competing at the national level for national championships, I started thinking, you know, my dad always said, you got to practice with what you play with. And I'd go to the farm and they'd always put this old work, work harness on. And I'd say, you know, I'm only going to be in the show ring for four minutes to win a world or a national championship. I need to practice once in a while in what I'm going to really mm -hmm. show in. And you show in probably something that you work, then you work your horse in every day, but it has a different feel. So I thought to myself, I need that. And that's where I got introduced to you. That's right. So how do you, I mean, these are made well and they'll last a long time unless you have a really strong horse that can break one of these. Yeah. So how do you continue to keep clients and continue to grow your business when you make kind of a lasting product? That's a difficult thing. As you know, it could be uh, you know, a declining curve in respect to production. We don't produce in the thousands. We produce you know, more in the hundreds. So it's, it's it's easy to maintain that level, but we still need a certain flow of newcomers coming into the business. We need um, new horses coming into the business. We have, we have to hope and pray that you have one driving horse and then you'll need another one, which means you'll need another set of harness. Exactly. Um, some of the reasons uh, behind our big development recently into so many different products the last, I guess since 2010, 2006 really, um, has been to facilitate that need that maybe you know you need a saddle you need a bridle you need a brow band your wife needs a handbag you need a belt for yourself uh part of that circle of On the care. handbag you got that right last christmas i'm starting to think what's unique and you have some unique and, and our viewers will see this you have some unique things that you've crafted out of some very good saddle leather and interesting colors so that's that right. was a Christmas gift last year. Exactly, for major major Christmas list, right? So, right. you know, this has been it because uh, it really is possible to sell you one product and then you're gone. And um, whether you choose to stay in the horse business or not, that's where we have to make an impression to say, if Craig leaves the business, how will we retain him as a customer? What else do we have to sell him? And that's sort of the short and long of it in respects to, um, maintaining you and re retaining you as a client. We're hoping you stay in the horse business, obviously, and you come back and buy more horse things, which you do. Right. But uh, in general, we're thinking, worst case scenario, what's the cost of acquisition of a customer? And how long can you keep that customer? And uh, what else can you sell that client? So I'd like to talk, I think that's interesting because we've talked a lot about harnesses, but not a lot about saddles. And I think I met, I think I met you first, not even on the harness mm -hmm. because so. my, my wife Carol needed a saddle mm -hmm. and one of our trainers says you really need to go visit with David he'll have the right he can this saddle and they were showing us one they had 
will be the right one for you. So how did you get, go from harness making to saddle making? Well, that's an interesting story. Um, not long after I sort of uh, hit the reset on my ladies' belt and handbag wholesale business, um, because it was a faster moving business than the harness business, I found myself in 95 bored, like really bored. Hey, you, these orders are great, but well, I get this big. We've got great orders, they're huge orders. The guys in the shop are building the orders. I'm doing the research. It's all going along fine, but it got a little boring. Because you're not at the workbench making them and fulfilling them, so you are the pioneer in the business trying to I'm figure a, out what's next. I'm a product developer. You know, I don't, really don't like to get in the production um, line per se because the phone's going to ring, it's going to take me away, and I'm going to hold somebody else up. So I do production, I do uh, product development, I do designing, I do things like that. Now I'm, I'm the first guy to hop in if we're late on a delivery because I know all the skills and trade, obviously. But but this is a great lesson for a lot of people in business. It's so easy to get into the production or the day-to-day -day of the business that we forget to stay on the frontier of the business. And I think that's something you've done well. So I'm anxious to hear so what this, happened in 95 when you were bored. This is an interesting story. So my late brother called me who was in the movie business and he told me William Shatner's in town shooting a, uh, a series. And uh, the series was called, I think, Tech Wars. So being the gregarious type of character that I have, <laughs> uh, I asked him, I said, uh, where's he shooting? And he gave me the, he gave me the um, studio phone number. And I called up and I got him on the phone and I said, uh, Mr. Shatner, it's David Friedman. He had no idea who I was. <laughs> and then I said, I built a set of harness for you last year for your fine harness mare, Eleanor Rigby. He said, oh yeah. I said, so there's a connection on the right horse away. level, right? The equestrian world is yeah, tight. I, I tossed it out right away. So he knew, he maybe didn't remember me or knew exactly who I was, but he had a connection to me through my product. Because one of the trainers had bought it for him. It was a good friend of ours, Melissa Moore. Oh, wow. And um, he said, well, what can I do for you? I said, no, the question is you're in Toronto now. What can I do for you? Is there anything that I can do for you? And he said to me, you know, I'd it's about three weeks before Lexington Junior League horse show, so it's late June. And he said, I'd really like to ride here. Is there a place we, uh, you could take me riding on an American Saddlebred? I said, sure, let me get back to you. And I hung up the phone. I knew nobody that had American <laughs> Saddlebreds in the whole greater Toronto area, five million people. And I found somebody that I did know, push comes to shove, that it was somebody that we had also gone back far with. I just hadn't seen his family in a lot of years. But anyways, uh, I called him back, picked him up downtown, took him riding, and then on the way home from our afternoon together, he said to me, can I see your shop? I said, sure, be an honor. Took him to the shop, walked him through, showed him everything, and he said to me, where um, do you make a saddle? I said, no, I don't make a saddle, I only make harness. And at that point, that's all I was really doing, fine right. harness. Gone back to the full harness. core. Full core vision. competency of the company, that's all I was doing. And um, he said, oh, interesting, and we left it. Three weeks later, I saw him at Lexington Junior League. Now I have, an, now I have an established relationship with him. He came up to me and, and said hello, and again, said he had a great time visiting in Toronto. And then he said, um, you don't make a saddle, do you? <laughs> again, and uh, again. There, third time, you don't I want said, to have to say that. I, no, I, said, I don't. I am not gonna answer this guy a third time. I went home <laughs> and I started thinking and working and developing, <laughs> and a year and a half later in, at the UPHA convention in San Diego in 1996, I launched my first saddle. Wow. I said, this guy, this opportunity is not gonna knock a third time without me. And what was that like? I mean, you had to do some research. You didn't just make any old saddle, copy something, did you, or? N well, it was, it was really difficult, and there were, there were a lot more people in the saddle business in this market at that time. And um, I knew I could do the quality, and I knew I could figure out what to do from a manufacturing standpoint. I knew, how, I knew that I could figure out how to set it up for line production. I knew all of that, so I had the confidence in the actual, you know, in the business side of, of how to manage it. But I really didn't have any clue what I wanted for rider setup, 
Um, I didn't understand that this is a type of sporting good and it has that the ultimate uh, measurement would deal with performance of the horse and the rider. You know, when you're talking about uh, horse sport, you know, you're talking about rider performance as an athlete and horse performance oh, as right. an athlete. So I, and one can't impede the other. So one cannot. be in sync. And it took a little while, and if you speak to some clients, they'll say it took a long time. <laughs> and, it, and it may have. I really don't think I got it right. Um, this is in 96. I really don't think I got it really right until um, 2009. It took but a long time. It wasn't that far a cry from what you did because it's still leather goods. It's still the next step through a harness to a saddle some of the you can call it disease of an entrepreneur mixed with a product developer along with a sixth generation old company is um, not resting on your laurels try to improve try to adjust uh, even you can use the word augment to build the products better and better and adjust and so there's already a huge market for saddles out there and how do you come as a newcomer to that and get people thinking, okay, harness maker, saddle maker, how did you get the, your customers to start to understand that you do something else well and that it's something they need to consider from the other myriad of choices in the saddle? You know, honestly, that's where having an international reputation really helps because people just dismissed not having a great quality saddle knowing that you had great quality harness. They just would never sit back and say, well, the quality won't be good, it's a Friedman. So they wow. knew the quality would be amazing. It was just a question of how does, how does the actual product operate? I guess going back to William Shatner's question, the, the, it was almost intuitive. If you make leather harnesses, you'll make leather saddles. Almost was. And, and so it was a complimentary market right away. It, and it fit. Um, I've spent a lot of time until last February just doing things within my core competency. You know, when you, when you think, what can you do? Well, it's easy to say anything leather. And I don't profess to be a leather expert per se, but I know a lot about leather. I've learned a lot about leather over the years, been in a lot well, of tanners. You've bought a lot, of, yeah, bought you bought a lot, a lot of leather. I've so you... a lot of leather back <laughs> that I didn't like. Um, but Which is key too, making sure you have the right suppliers. That's because right. Your, your product needs to hold up. That's right, so you know, um, anything that's leather, I always thought, oh, I could find a way to do it. If I can't do it, I can figure out how to do it. Um, and again, back to my late father, he was, uh, he was a guy that just, you know, figure it out, keep working, keep building prototypes, keep working at it, you'll get it figured out. I have another question along that line in marketing and trying to do it. How do you determine how to price your product? Yeah, because it's a lot of time at a bench and that's not everyone's that's a, the same. No, so. that's a difficult, difficult question to answer. First of all, you know, I think like any product, you have to decide what the market can bear. And, right. So um, what the perceived value is. So David, one thing that's always a curious question of our viewers and audience is how do you go about pricing a product that really it's hard to know how many hours are going to go into making a harness or making a saddle? Well, pricing products are, is a very difficult thing for anybody in manufacturing, anybody in business. And I think a lot of people leave out um, a lot of key components, especially around not so much what is your gross margin and how much money you're going to make and what's going to end up in your pocket or in your business, but more Which so. Which is a key component, but there's something more important. Yeah, how are you gonna service this product? You own a business like this and you, you know yourself, you see me out in the ring, in the warm-up ring when you're getting ready to go in and I show up, you're like, right. what is he doing here? Yeah, well, making just, sure the I'm, harness is working the way it's I'm supposed I'm just to. checking to see that everything's performing the way it should be and can we make it better and what can I learn from this to make it better? Um, maybe that trip didn't cost me anything, but you know, if it came back for a repair that was um, a problem or, um, I, or your trainer had a problem fitting and I need to make an adjustment, then there is a cost to service. Um, and those those costs are really hard to bill. You know, I can't send you a bill for $30 after you've spent several thousand. It's not just not my style. So um, you, have to ha you have to have the margins built in for your time and for other materials and other services, whether it's, um, whether it's a, a service of just coming out for a visit or actually doing 
work on the product. Uh, it, you know, and that's truly what you do. So it goes beyond just here's my price and my gross margin. Here's I'm going to provide a service that is superior to potentially my competition. And I need to build in enough value in the perception of the owner who's buying this that I can provide that without feeling like I'm nickel, nickel and diming them after the sale. Yeah, because we're small in respects to actual uh, product numbers going out, sure, we, some items we make hundreds of, but you know, we don't make thousands and thousands of anything. I, I still have to work with the old theory of if you don't make money on one, you're not going to make money on 20 or 30 or even 100. And if margins are skinny in the beginning, they're skinny at the end. How'd you learn so, that? You, know, you learn that the hard way. <laughs> you learn that the hard way. I did a job for a gentleman outside of Boston. It was a big eight horse hitch years ago. And I, I never forget this it was in 96. And he asked me, how much was the harness? How much is the harness? And it was a lot of money. It was serious dollars. And um, Serious Ooh. Canadian dollars, not U.S. No, this was, yeah, this may have been U.S. <laughs> dollars at the time. I think it was in the 60s, wow. 66,000 or 68,000. Not and to scare everybody away, these don't cost that no, much. No, no. It was a huge set of heavy horse harness. And um, I ran through the money in the shop. Wow. Most, mostly in labor. Well, I didn't underestimate raw materials, but it was the first time that I'd done this type of job, and I ran through it by a lot. Okay, by 20, 18, 20%. Wow. And um, I delivered the harness. The gentleman was very happy. Of course. And, Probably couldn't get anybody in the world to make it. And he said to me, is everything okay? Did you do okay? And I said, I did perfect. And um, it's fine. And he said to me, great, thanks. I shook his hand and I walked away. Wow. <laughs> That's because crazy. it's his... My pricing problem is not his issue. Right. I gave the gentleman a price. I have to stand by the price. And um, I delivered the job. And funny enough, that, phone, that gentleman made a phone call to people in um, St. Louis, Missouri, at Anheuser-Busch, and I ended up with the entire Budweiser contract from that. Wow. So that was really the cost of advertising. It was the cost of acquisition, <laughs> <laughs> right? So, yeah. you know, where my margins continued to remain skinny, but we did nice work for 10 years. <laughs> wow, so, that's great. You know, I mean, was, what a great story. What a great lesson, though. And, you know, fortunately, it, didn't put, it wasn't so big that it put you out of business because you had a, a stable enough business otherwise, but yeah. you have to be careful. You, you, you always have to be cognizant of costs, of time, of labor. Um, you know, your OPEX, your operational expenses are not a moving target because you know what they are and you can calculate them and spend enough time really defining and, and measuring ups and downs in those expenses. But when it comes to labor, um, that's another story, especially today. In, with in the, a craft, in a, especially in a craft and it, like you have. But what I love about what you did, and I think I've heard others that have been guests on our show say the same thing, and that is I don't want to take the problems I've had fulfilling the product and providing the service and make it my customer's problem. I'm not going to tell them what I went through. I'm just going to deliver a superior product, superior service, and let it stand for itself. And, exactly. and it comes exactly. back around. And that's what they purchased. Yeah. They didn't purchase that you had a problem with the leather, you didn't like it, you cut up a bunch and threw it away. That's, that wasn't their thing. That's for you to take up with your own raw material supplier, even though it's only the cost of materials, not labor, which is still you know, it's significant, but not nothing compared to the labor. They really don't want to know about those problems. They want a beautiful, finished, good, finished product, and they want it to perform. And I think that's last. a great key to success. I appreciate that. You know, you're doing something also that's unique now. I mean, we live in a different world since the pandemic and also since certain, uh, the Patriot Act and other things that have been passed over the last 10, 15 years. You operate a business in Canada and sell throughout the world, but one of your big markets is coming to horse shows in the United States. So how have you surmounted this crossing the border and you're bringing lots of goods? You've been pretty innovative there. So I'd like our, our uh, audience to hear a little bit about how you overcame an obstacle like that. Being small um, or large, I think, is about, and actually making it through hard times, good times, all times in business is really about being nimble and about being rec able to recognize opportunities um, and taking those opportunities if, if you can. 
Um, we saw in the early 2000s um, that as the business was really growing in the States, um, an international border, even though free trade was in place, um, there's obstacles, it's difficult. It's difficult to ship to the end user. There's duties, there's, or not duties and taxes, but there's brokerage services. There's, there's different um, costs that are involved with getting an end product to a customer. One of the, one of the things was our, our saddle and our handbag business. We just couldn't see tacking on another $35 for customs brokers to, you know, our customs broker to get a $300 handbag out. It was over 10% of the cost wow. on top of charging freight. Um, we decided that we would open a, uh, a retail store and warehouse in Kentucky, which we felt was Mecca for the horse wow. business. Um, and um, we would start a U.S. corporation and um, get the business rolling in the States. Along with that uh, came, you know, operating a business now in two countries, let alone in four currencies. But now, now, you, have to, now you have to, you know, deal with, you know, laws of other countries right. and regulations of other countries. Right, employment and otherwise. Uh, exactly, which I had to learn a lot about, which really did not align with, you know, anything in Canada, including health care, care which Right, you struggled. would think of being so close and border and yeah. so friendly that our ways of doing business would be similar, but not. Not, not at all. And um, luckily, um, my wife now, Nicole, um, had experience um, in the horse business, was looking for something to do. We came up with this idea together um, at a show that she was helping with, an Arabian show. And uh, we opened up this little retail and warehouse in Midway, Kentucky, and um, started uh, to get the business rolling. We were shipping pallets you know, wow. one, one every other week, one every three weeks type of thing from Toronto down to Midway, Kentucky. She unloaded the pallet. So out, all of a sudden you didn't have to deal with customs brokers. One, one, time one, bro time. one time brokerage for an entire pallet. So there'd be repairs, there'd be harness, there'd be handbags, there'd be belts, there'd be halters, there'd be all kinds of products on this pallet. And, um, the, you know, they'd be, it'd be crossing commercially, so it would be brokered in, and then she'd unload the pallets, ship out all the repairs, put some of these finished goods on the shelf, and we had ourselves a little bit of a retail experience going. People would come in. Of course, there's a lot of American Saddlebird people in that area, so we got some support right away. And um, with the notion of building a pick-and-pack operation that had a... Um, a facade of a retail in the front. Wow, <laughs> and, that's pretty um, innovative so that you have people running the shop and also picking and packing in a warehouse. Which takes a different type of person as well because you have to have people that are dressed up that look like you know, they're there for retail. Meanwhile, you, know, you, you walk out the front door and they're in the back putting product in boxes and shipping it out. So, and then receiving now a skid a week, you know, so wow. a lot more product. And um, that, uh, that business really grew the last number of years, and it's been really interesting, along with you know, having to um, apply for US visa. Um, funny enough, uh, three years ago, Nicole and I got married. She moved to Toronto, and she had to apply for a Canadian work, work permit visa while she's waiting for a permanent residency. She's gonna remain an American citizen. So, and you um, had to get a work visa for the United States. And I had to get a work visa, which has to be renewed every few years for the United States. Um, interesting, you know, when, when you're not used to the business climate, and somebody approaches you, then you're really skeptical. You know, I remember I stopped at customs one time and the gentleman asked me, the customs officer, what, what's your status? I said, status, I don't know, married, single, I didn't know what to tell the guy. He said, no, no, what's your, what's your immigrant status? I said, I'm a visitor, I have a business in the States and I'm just coming down to visit. He said, well, who's paying you? I said, well, my Canadian company's paying me. He says, how do we know that? Oh, wow. Because I'm telling you that, but that's not an answer for a customs no, for officer. Custom, right. Yeah. That's not what they want to no, hear. No, he said, well, we have something called the Patriot Act. Our, our, uh, our president, Obama at the time, he says he wants to know who's coming into the States and who's doing what and where they're working. I said, okay, great. So apply for, apply for a visa, no problem. We've got that organized and I've been on that visa for, oh, I think since 2008 or nine. But I think that's the thing we have to look at. As much as we don't like regulation, once you understand and comply, 
to, to a degree, right, rather than fight it. It makes it easy, and it's not that costly. I don't imagine your, your work piece is that expensive to renew. No, it's Compared not. to the business you do. No, it's, day. you know, I think it ends up costing me 15 or 1800 a year, but at the end of the day, it's funny you say that, because as a Canadian, I always feel like I'm a little more compliant anyways. <laughs> so, you know, so sure, you know, they tell us to do this, we'll do it, you know, it's, 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 um, even though there's a lot to do and you know, some hoops to jump through and a lot of paperwork to organize, um, it's it's part of uh, of those regulations that have to be respected. And I would want uh, you know my government now my governments because I'm doing business <laughs> right, in two countries. Two um, you know you you'd want them to be you know know what's going on. What I think I see in you, David, is someone who really takes and can, out of difficult circumstances, go back and reflect and get a vision of how to take this challenge or difficulty or not wanting to say no to William Shatner that you don't make saddles a third time, to be innovative and be able to hit that reset button and move forward with a vision and with a plan being determined to see how you can make that successful. I think you like the challenge, don't you? Yeah, I do. And I'm really driven by those challenges, especially if it's something that's interesting to me. Most of the time, if it's interesting to my clients, it's interesting to me. Right. So that's sort of what drives my, uh, my boat, so to speak. Um, I hear it once, I hear it twice, then obviously there's a need. And if there's a need, um, I feel that if, if I have the know-how, I will go through that door. And then, of course, the entrepreneurial disease sets in and <laughs> you will take it until you can't take it anymore, uh, whether it's, there's costs involved. Giving up is a hard thing to do as an entrepreneur, as you know. It is, you but it also takes that. Because if you do give up, that, that's admitting failure right away without even trying. And so yeah. there, there's a bit of effort there. The other thing that I like that I think that you demonstrate well, and, and that is the ability to listen to the customer and find your niche and really carve that finely to really understand not just, oh, I'd like to have a saddle. You didn't just go out and do any saddle. You did a lot of research. So you really try to carve into what your niche is and, and play to your strengths. That's my father. Really? Do what you do, do it better than anybody. Do the best of your ability. Just try your best, give it all you got. And, um... and people appreciate that. You know, when people know you've done your best, and you're doing all you can, people will appreciate that because you're putting heart into it. And you said that earlier, this is a part of you. And I think that's what any good business owner would say about their business, it becomes part of them, almost their child, almost their baby. And it becomes very personal and very real. And therefore the customer's reaction to it is very important to you. How much does that motivate you? It, it, for me, it's the whole thing. It's that emotional experience and um, tying myself to a product, tying myself to a need, um, the drive, and more so because it's really hard to attach a timeline to any of this development. You don't know, is it going to take you six months, two years? You know, we developed our first piece of apparel. It took two and a half years to develop. I put more time into it than some other of our six successful products. But the, ten the tenacity of uh, of wanting it to work and the time and effort and just be and just and want it to be well received by your customer exactly and, and um, it's another opportunity to expand exactly. your reach into the customers you already have that's that's our success and uh, I'm willing to you know I really don't think about my competitors much in re in respects to what they're doing I just wanted to do what our customers want us to do and have that available. And uh, I keep going down that road, and I, and I think we mentioned in a, in a previous conversation together, I, I see that as a lot of road still to travel at, at 56 years old. I don't see, you know, that I'm coming to the end of, end of my rope or end of my road. And, and I think that's going. the key to success. It's almost an oxymoron because they don't really teach it in business school. They always say go out and measure the competition, and I think there's something to that. You, oh, have, you to have to look at what other doing. people do. Yeah, yeah, of course. But you have to create your own path. And when you create your own path, you become a little agnostic to what your competition's doing because 
you know what you're trying to reach to your customers, and you're going to do it in a different way. And it, and it may not be what your what your competitors are, are trying to do at exactly. all, which is fine also. Right. Because so you, it's not you, copy, copying somebody no. else that you're going to get success. It's pioneering your path yeah. Ano- because you understand your customers better than anyone else. Another one of my dad's you know theories was you know mind your own business, you got enough to do. You know, but minding your own business might mean minding the business per se. Right. Um, I think you have to know what the competition's doing. You have to know what the offering is, and sometimes that also drives a clear path to how to improve, how to product develop. You know where the hole in the market is, um, and a lot of those revelations of those holes come through competitive markets realizing um, there's an opening uh, in a, in the sector for a, a product that has not been refined, redeveloped, maybe the same thing we've used for 150 years or 50 years and just it's time. It's just time, you know, so that's what we do. So and you're the chief R&D officer too. I'm the head R&D guy. <laughs> yeah. And some, some, some of the R&D is a little more, you know, strenuous than, others, uh, than other products. Some of it we go down, we go, this is just not for us, but you know. Well, I'm anxious to get a tour here, and I know you have customers who've already been sneaking in, beating the path to your door this morning, and I appreciate you taking the time. But there's a question that we always ask on the Biz Sherpa that no one can escape, and that is, what is your greatest failure, and what did you learn from it? Oh, that's a... The greatest failure is um, not being able to trust myself through difficult times. Um, not uh, being able, as you would say, to hit the reset when you need to and maybe hanging on too long to some different uh, things that we've done over the years where you really needed to either hard or soft reset, right. you know. Um, but you had a passion for it and you want to give it enough perseverance to see if it can work. It, exactly. And, so um, what did you learn from that? How, do you, how, do you, how have you changed? How have you evolved to help do that more easily? You know, I think that, first of all, I think the pressure of taking over a family business and filling shoes of a reputation that you didn't build is an unconscious um, moment in your life anyways. You know, when I took over this business, you know, I took it over because I worked for my dad for nine years. I was with my dad for nine years, day in, day out. So we really knew each other. I knew what he liked. I knew what he didn't like and how to operate. But filling those shoes um, at 27 years old, you have to be pretty unconscious because, you know, or really not all there because honestly, <laughs> honestly, you know, um, you know, in the 90s, mid to late 90s, I look back, oh my God, what have I done? You wow. know, because I've taken on all of this and I can't not make it work his way. And that was probably um, one of my biggest lessons of what not to do. It's just, I'm not my father and my father wasn't me nor my grandfather, nor any other family member. But adjusting those business practices, including all the human resources people involved, whether they're accountants, lawyers, or shop workers, or or people in the office, to get them to work your way in the way that you need them to work with your style and and, um, your acumen is different and um, not easy. Right, so you, you can't be your dad, you can't replicate that. You, you can't do it. And um, of course you have, you don't want the same thing out of life. So there you make some mistakes and you hang on too long. And uh, mo- most, mostly because of the uncertainty, mostly. Not because um, you, know, you, you just sort of can't see through it. You're just not certain what to do. You don't have the experience. You know, honestly, I don't know the left side from the right side of a balance sheet when my father <laughs> passed away. I didn't have to do that. My dad took care of that. Right. And I was in the back with the guys making harness, learning the trade, learning the business. So you have to learn all of these things and you have to spend the time learning it and learning it well, whether you like it or not. You know, still to this day, I find numbers painful. But, you know, I sit myself down and study and look at them every day until I like them, until I embrace them. And um, some of those pieces, um, you know, I wish I knew more about earlier on because they maybe would have carved an easier path to where we are today, or maybe not. Right. But But I think it's through our difficulties that we learn the most and we become even better at what we do. I had had another business mentor along the way, he was a very bright gentleman who was in the sporting goods business in Canada. 
And he said to me, Friedman, life is research and research is free. And I never forgot that because wow. you can learn a lot from a lot of people. And one of the reasons why I interact so well with um, our clients, a lot of them are successful business people. They have a lot to offer. Pay and you're attention. not afraid to ask. I'm not afraid to ask and I'm not afraid to pay attention to them. And that intrigues me. That intrigues me, especially with a gentleman like you over the years. So I've always asked you questions, oil and gas, different things you've been involved with, real estate, and sort of watched you and your family uh, learn and grow through this business. And obviously with others as well, just it's not a lot of people have that opportunity, but it's an opportunity I urge other entrepreneurs and business people to take because it costs nothing. And... Um, you'd be surprised with the type of information and knowledge that you can build yeah. that adds to your own um, thinking and knowledge. And that it's helps interesting, clear the it path. falls within your own cadre of clients that you can get this mentorship or inspiration. It can always add and learn. Great. Well, David, again, I really appreciate you taking the time at this show to be our guest and to share your secrets to success. I think your story is inspiring and the experiences that you've had really can demonstrate to a lot of business owners how they can be more successful. I appreciate that you would take the time to, today in the middle of a, a horse show, a busy horse show for you, to share your success with us. Thank you very much, Craig, for having us. It's been a pleasure. Great. This is Craig Willett, the Biz Sherpa. Thanks for joining us for this episode. Be sure to go to our website to access the resources related to this episode at www.bizsherpa.co. If you enjoyed this show, tell your friends about us and be sure to rate our podcast. Craig would like to hear from you, so share your thoughts in the Facebook community at bizsherpa.co. Follow us on Twitter at bizsherpa underscore co and on Instagram at bizsherpa.co.